When you believe that life is just like men say it is, you are full of contradictions. We become full of contradictions. We become unsettled. I know a lot of Christians right now are tired of the internal storm. How many of you are tired of that internal storm? I remember the days when I went through these internal storms, constantly trying to, to grab hold of righteousness, but having to grapple with the world. And it almost seemed like in order to live in this world, you could not fully embrace biblical things. Some of you know precisely what I'm talking about. But it's also the time when I began to learn about the trust of the Lord. Is it easy? You better believe it's not. It is not easy, no matter what anybody says, right? When you have experience separating yourself from the world, it is not easy. It is downright frightening. And thank God that some of you have been, you have a good foundation in Christ, enough that you have broken your severs and ties to this world. Doesn't mean you don't draw a paycheck from the world. That's not what that means. It means that you no longer dive into the practices of men. You are no longer trying to belong to men in the world. You're not trying to have position among them, but you stand for something different now. But it's also time that those of you who have made it to that mark, that you vigorously and persistently teach others, demonstrate to them the ways of the Lord. Kindness is being depleted all over the earth. People are calling wrong right and right wrong. Discernment is becoming clouded and polluted. And I guess I'm coming on today to encourage you guys don't forget those things. Don't forget who you are. And never forget the people right around you are suffering. Listen, one of our problems with discernment is we are so much in the practice that if we don't see it, we don't know about it. And, and of course, you guys know I'm somewhat of an oddball. I don't have to be prompted for everything. But I'm telling you, there are people around you that are suffering. So I want to tell you this. Don't cut your hearts off. Don't do it. Don't cut your hearts off from your brothers and your sisters. There are too many people suffering in silence. That's when your life is literally going down the drain, but you haven't said a word. And because you don't say a word, those without discernment will never know you're in trouble. Somehow we've got to change that. That internal unction that you guys get, don't ignore it. Don't let the words of men stop you from sowing into somebody else's life. Please don't do that because that's precisely what's happening. You know how you get this unction internally? You may see somebody walking down the street or something, you know him, you say, you know what? I think that person's not doing too well. I think they need some help. But then the words of men hit your mind. Maybe uh, some statement you heard or some argument about the border. And then it's almost like a satanic voice will speak to you and say, nah, they're just trying to get more. They need to learn to manage what they have. Don't be one of those people. Well, I'm telling you, your father in heaven is going to be just that way to you. In your hour where you need mercy, grace, because some of you will not need financial things. You're going to need your health. And if you set yourself up not to sow any merciful thing upon anybody else because you refuse to listen to that voice of the Lord, mercy is going to be withheld from you and your hour that's going to make or break your situation here on earth. Don't set yourself up to be like that, please. There are too many people. They're hurting in this. You know, I know a lot of people who may love pep rallies. I don't do pep rallies. I don't believe in pepping people up and getting them in a certain mood so that they start doing things. I don't believe in that. I believe in love itself. I believe in God's discernment he has gifted all of us with. I believe that we know things that nobody has ever told us. And I believe that we can perceive things of one another that nobody ever spoke. But as the world is increasing in its hatred and violence and lascivious acts, so are many in the body of Christ closing their hearts off to one another. Skeptical. Can't trust him. Satan speaks with accusation. He's always going to point out a fault. Don't live your life by the faults of somebody else. See them with eyes of love. Understand that all of us have faults, but people are in trouble. Folks, please, you got to watch in these days. You have to watch the tongues of the vipers who will teach you one thing, how to turn away from somebody else. Listen to me. If somebody teaches you to turn your back on somebody, how can that person teach you any biblical thing? You're armored on the front side. You're not armored on the back side. You can face anything. You're sent as sheep among wolves. And among those wolves or the prey of the wolves. And those people who are caught by the wolves are crying out. You're the only one that can hear that cry. You were put on this earth in answer to somebody's prayer. Because somebody said, Lord, please send somebody that can reach these people. Every time one of these small sheep are among wolves and they die of horrible circumstances. Most often they die with a prayer. Lord, send somebody to tell your message that no one else die like me. That's how they pass away. With a tender heart, thinking about everybody else but themselves, asking that the Lord send someone 
You know what he did? He had you born on this earth. You know what Satan is doing? Instead of you being the one, being the answer to the prayer so many need, every time you would walk forward to answer that call, Satan speaks and says, don't trust it. He's always telling people the waters are rough. Always. And what do we do when the waters are rough? We do not go in the water, not knowing that you were made to go into rough waters, to walk on the water without a boat. That's what you were sent for, to do the impossible in the face of so many. That's what you were meant for. See, that's a spiritual knowing within yourselves that you will never be able to justify nor figure out. It eats at you. You know that the Lord's word is true. But you ask yourself, how come none of it's working through me? I'll tell you why. Because you're not going into the water. If you had Scooby gear on, you would never know that Scooby gear works perfectly until you go in the water. So you're on the beach with Scooby gear, but you've not entered into the water. And you're asking, where's this feeling of weightlessness? When does that come? Well, it's never going to come because you're still on the beach. Because Satan has convinced you, don't go into the waters you can't trust it. Not knowing you've been sent to go into rough waters. Hopefully that makes sense to somebody. When you go forward, you go forward with responsibility, not haphazardly. Don't do anything haphazard. Do it responsibly. There's a key to a cheerful giver who gives unto his neighbor, unto people who really need. There's a key to them. Why they can be cheerful in the first place. They don't do things haphazardly, but they know the condition of their own flock. And do you know that was a command by our Father? We are to know the condition of our own flock. I do not subscribe to half of what this world subscribes to when it says, well, if you don't have enough for this bill or that bill, just give it to the church. I don't believe in that. How can I rob a power company and give it to a cause where somebody needs it when you promise to pay that bill in the first place? They've already rendered service. You cannot break one oath to make another. You cannot murder on the left hand and bless on the right hand. You can't do it. You cannot steal on the left hand and give her the right hand. This is not the days of Robin Hood. You can't do it. Everything you do charitably, freely of your heart, you do with great responsibility and with a knowing. Knowing first where it came from, your father or some other motivation, but you know where it came from. Hopefully it is your father. You go forward with all faith and purpose everything you do. But please don't cut those folks off around you. Time to stand up, utilize that discernment. If you have an unction about somebody, right? Because I've done this plenty of times. Having an unction about someone, but but I'm not sure. You know what I'll do? I'll go up to the person. I'll start a conversation. I'll, I'll do it in a heartbeat. And then, sure enough, it pops out. And I'm already prepared for that situation. Do you guys understand? See, I'm not one of those. If I'm not sure, I'm going to walk away. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to walk away. Nope, but I'm not doing that. When I'm not sure, that's when I have to verify. When my discernment is low in certain places, that's when I have to verify. I have to be sure, so I just go up and ask the person. I'll just make it plain. But if anything comes in my head and causes me to accuse the person, I will toss it out quickly. I don't listen to such things. You know how many times this happened here in COT? Oh, don't do so and so for such and such. Because if you do, it's stop. I don't permit such things. What about those who, you know, people who talk? There was a person that talked about me like a dog. Then they had a dire need. And it just so happened in that moment, we could help. We did help without hesitation. See, that's how the Lord works. Just like that. But what about those folks around you? What about the folks in your neighborhood? When was the last time you went down to your neighborhood kitchen where they feed people? And just asked them, can I do anything? Can I give you something? When was the last time you looked into those charitable things in your community? I tell you, love and people is just drying up. Violence is breaking out. The time of the harvest is right now. And we're not talking about getting rich and all this stuff. That's not what we're talking about. Nor are we talking about emptying your pockets. We're talking about acts of love in a time where people are chopping love off. They don't want to love their neighbor. They want to shut all their doors and windows. They want a big booming voice from the sky to say, you're going to make it through. Everything is okay. I'm telling you, the way out of the current crisis is to love even more. With that commitment, you become an overcomer. It's kind of like when you read Zephaniah, right? We start reading in Zephaniah. You start seeing all the destruction and the things that God is displeased with in the book of Zephaniah. You begin to ask yourself, what in the world do they do to deserve this? Then we read the whole book. You begin to understand something. God's not playing around. He's not playing games. Man is playing games. Our father is quite serious in everything he's going to do. Men are the ones that have said, well, you know, God is is, is laughing and all they're doing. They don't know what he's doing. But we know this. Everything is progressively moving towards some major things happening in the earth. And when those major things come, 
It doesn't matter if a person has all the preparations in the world. They put themselves in a 30-foot steel cage or steel box full of oxygen, full of food and everything else. It's not going to help them against what's coming. And did you guys hear about in, in 2015? There were some folks in 2012, of course, everybody started building these underground shelters. You guys remember about that, right? They were selling these underground shelters. You guys remember that? First, they started talking about, well, you need to have all your preparations underground, which was foolishness in the first place. But this is what they did. They say you need to have all of it underground. So these companies start popping up and they start making these underground modules that you can actually buy. Well, they sold quite a bit. Continue to hear me. They sold quite a bit. Now, mind you, some of the same people who were talking about the 2012 thing are out there today doing the exact same thing. Hint, hint, note, note. So they sold these underground modules and buckets of food. Out of all the modules they sold, not one of them survived. This particular company. And it wasn't only that one, but I'm talking about one. You know what happened to all of them? When the rains came, all of them filled with mud. Every single last one of them filled with mud. And now it's like concrete. Everything inside was lost. Some people invested their entire lives, their entire savings of their life in these underground little tiny facilities, little chambers, little pods, and they lost everything. Some people sold everything they had and they lost everything. But do you know why millions of people lost everything? Does anybody know why? Anybody give me the short answer? I'll tell you why. They believed the evidence that was presented to them. They did not operate by faith, but they believed the evidence that was presented before them. They allowed evidence to change what God had naturally put in them. Let me ask you this. Are you doing the same? Didn't your father in heaven naturally put things in you when you were a child? You know about things that nobody else did. He naturally put them into you. How many of you have allowed evidence to change what God naturally put into you? And how many times do we have to learn the same lesson? Here's a lesson. Here it is right here. It's when you automatically know something. But then over time, you allow evidence to change it, new findings change it. And then something happens, and you're mad at yourself saying, I should have never altered what I believed in the first time. Because now it manifested, and I already knew it was going to manifest. But because I changed it, because I started believing something else, I feel foolish. Faith is not evidence. Faith is also not foolishness. Do you know that? With great integrity and responsibility. Faith does work, but it also requires responsibility. We're not talking about your imaginations. We're talking about what all of us, what the Lord put in all of us when we were young. Before we ever got here, we had unknowing about a few things. People are doing that once again by the weight of evidence. They're making moves. Listen, that means you're letting evidence guide your steps. That's what you're doing. They're doing it again. And while everybody's going to start following the evidence, let me tell you the flip side of that. The same thing that happened in 2012, it's the same thing that's going to happen now, and I pray it does not. I pray I can just mess it up. There were a lot of churches during 2012 people just stopped giving money to. I knew the reason, but a lot of people didn't. See, a lot of people started taking their money out of fear and everything else. They began to invest in these weird things, but they stopped giving to the mission of the gospel. They just totally stopped giving. But all the while, if you start looking at the bookwork, all these companies that were selling little tiny buckets of foods, they were making millions of dollars. So they had enough to both buy the food and sell it at 300 times what it costs. Enough that all of them bought mansions, new cars, made investments, this, that, and the other. They're looking good now. But nothing happened on 2012. But they made a bunch of rich people because people invested in the evidence that was presented to them. And they stopped operating by faith. Had people operated by faith during that time, they would have sowed into their neighbors. They would have sowed into children. They would have sowed into any mission of the gospel. They would have sowed in everything there because if you believe that things are about to be destroyed and your father, your Lord is coming, if you truly believe that, you know he comes with accountability. That means you have to stand before him and give account of all things in your life. If people really believe that, then wouldn't you get your soul right? Not get your flesh protected, but get your soul right? Wouldn't that be the primary objective is to make sure that you're clean, unspotted? If people really believe that the Messiah was coming back, they go through the house and start throwing out everything. They say, oh, I'm not going to be caught with this in my home when the Messiah comes. This and that won't be in my heart when the Messiah comes. I'm not going to have this over here. And I didn't respond to my neighbor who needed help. But I'm not going to. I'm going out to help them because I'm not going to be one of those who just sat here and waited, who sat on the coin that the Lord gave them in the beginning and presented the same coin back. I'm not going to be one of those. My Lord is coming. He's going to say, what did you do with the life I gave you? 
and no one can utter a lying word before him. So with the life God has given all of us, what will we say? The Lord already told us what all humanity will say. There are scenarios because many will say, well, I really didn't believe you were coming back. I really believed that we were on our own. That's what it is when a person says God will not do good nor evil. That's a person saying we have to make decisions down here. God is not involved. So when you read that in the Bible, when God says what he will do to those who said in their hearts, God will not do good nor evil, then you'll know. That's when men think things are happenstance on the earth, like God is not managing everything down here on this earth. Everything is highly purposed because you're here. This whole the earth was created for you. You were not created for the earth. The animals were created for you. You were not created for the animals. The atmosphere, the waters, how things are, they were created for you. You were not created for them. God built a house and he prepared it carefully. And that house is called earth. Then he put his children in that house. And he said, grow and keep my ways. But when the children grew, they said, no one put us here. We just, you know, happened to be here. Isn't that what the world says? And now that the owner of the one who made the house is on the way back, and he already said what he would do in the process of coming back, he told us what he would do. He also told us that generations of people would lie in deceit before he came back. In other words, they would be taken by the doctrines of this world. And I'm telling you that in this hour, you got to be careful. People are fighting to have you believe in things. And that's what I want to leave you with. Folks, follow me on this. Please listen to this carefully. And don't let this be a mystery to you. What you are witnessing in the world is a fight to have you believe in something. And if you don't believe that, then write that down on a piece of paper and say, people are fighting to have me believe in something. That's all you got to write down. I want you to write it down so that you can remember. And every time you hear someone talk, you tell me that they're not fighting to have you believe in something they want you to believe in. Because if you turn on your television, it's a war going on right now to convince you to believe in what they're saying. If, if you turn to CNN, C-SPAN, any of those channels, it's a fight over you. They're killing each other to get you to believe in what they're presenting. Start listening to things in truth because that's precisely what's happening. Why would people kill each other to get you to believe a certain way? And worst of all, why would a believer in Christ kill somebody else to get you to believe in a certain way? When Jesus already said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. See, there's something happening now that all people are engaged in. And if you're not careful, you're going to mess up. You're not going to see the true fight at hand of which just about everybody's engaged. Right now, everybody's engaged. If you write that down, what I told you to write down, you can listen to yourself speak and you're going to find out you've been advocating for somebody in the world to have somebody else believe in a specific way. You're going to hear it come out of your own mouth. How many people are fighting to get you to believe in the words of Christ? And you know what? To be frank with you, to be honest, to be open, to be candid with you. Just like I have a responsibility over every word I say, you have a responsibility not to let me slip. Because I'll tell you right now, if you start hearing me advocate, for what men have established in this earth, you, you better interrupt the broadcast and tell me. And just simply say, Mike, that is of men. Aren't we here to say what is of our Father, not of men? You have that responsibility. Because if I ever begin to advocate for men, I've lost it. I'm not here to advocate for men. I am but a man who is growing in Christ. And as I grow, I intercede for those men who are lost. By the word, that word men means ladies also. That's humanity. As I grow, I intercede, as the Lord purposes me to intercede. But I am not to bolster viewpoints of men. I am not to bolster a man-made kingdom, anything in the earth. But we are to hold the banner of righteousness high. And every single banner of righteousness, there's a name attached to it. Jesus of Nazareth. You cannot have righteousness absent the name of Jesus, or it is not righteousness of the Father. Because no one goes to the Father but by Christ. And anybody who tries to make their way up any other way is a thief. Jesus said, you know what that means, don't you? There's a lot of people who follow something, but they're trying to go around Christ. Haven't you noticed? Folks, be careful in these things. Don't let yourselves slip. Yes, there are horrific things happening, but understand that you have a voice. You have an audience with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who can change men's hearts, who can make the impossible possible. And he's not here to do what we can do, folks. God is not here to do what we can do. He's here to do above and beyond what we could ever think of doing. If you pray for God to do something, 
if man can do it, he's going to send a servant. But if you pray for him to do something that man couldn't, comp- couldn't possibly accomplish, and it be pleasing unto the Lord, it shall be done. Watch your hearts. Please don't let any set of events on this earth consume your hearts. Watch out for one another, being careful that we're staying ourselves on the words of faith. That means even if you see something, don't be so quick to validate it, to say that is what it is, because plenty are going to see the beast do miraculous things. That does not mean the beast is Christ. Let no one extinguish your flame of love. All of you, when you were born, you were in love with love itself. You needed love. And because love was betrayed, some of you have semi-hardened hearts, and you know it. It's time for you to step beyond that. Get away from the blame. Understand it took place, but the assault did not work to destroy you, but it worked to grow you. But I know that in your lives, someone betrayed love in your life. They tried to teach you over time that love is a weakness. And ever since that time, many of you have taken love and stuck you, put it in a vault so that no one could recognize that love was the apple of your eye. But I know different. And I know that you don't want people stomping over your hearts because it's a vulnerability with you. It hurts. But let me tell you something. You have grown since that time. And no one has the authority nor the power to trample over your hearts again. But take your heart out of the vault of that self-protected place and place it into the hands of the Messiah. And all of your trust and expectations put in Him and do that immediately. That's the only way you can be free to love everybody else. Of all the people, you're the ones who, while you do have love in your heart for other folks, you cannot love everybody. It's almost like a dirty secret you refuse to share. Time to take your heart out of that vault you built yourself. You know how when someone gets close, you say, no, I can't do this because something's going to go wrong with it. That's your heart in a vault. Those are the vault walls around your heart. Don't let this person get close because it may end up like the other time. Don't let this person get close because betrayal is right around the corner. Time for you to realize, yes, they're in the flesh. These things are going to happen. Place your heart in the Father's hands. Turn all of what you need into the hands of the Messiah. In other words, don't look in the earth for fulfillment of love, but look to the Lord that you may love your brother. Only as you do this will you begin to understand it. Until you do it, you will not understand it. And don't let the world, this battle that's right in your face, that's over you, please don't let them win. I want you to write this down. Number one, they're fighting for our trust. That's number one. B, they're fighting for us to believe in what they present. Do you know they spend billions on this every day? They spend billions of dollars to fight for you to believe in a way that they present. Now, in order to fight for you to trust them, you're going to have to make everybody else guilty. They're fighting to make you believe in what they are presenting. And in order to do that, they must prove everything else wrong. Look at those elements that constitutes most conversations. Those are the elements at hand in this war that you see right in front of your faces. And if you don't believe me, Keep this list in front of you when you're having a conversation with somebody else and watch what comes out of your mouth. You may not even know it, but you're doing the same things. If you are a target in this war, you're going to speak the exact same way. Once you see it, break it and say, "Uh uh-uh, no more. These same people, right, number two, is another point, is the proof. The proof is, this is proof of the fine. The proof is, if you don't accept their presentation, they get mad. If you don't believe their presentation, they get very angry. I want you guys to keep that written down and refer to it because then you're going to ask what in the world are all these people doing this for because they're doing it over and over and over again see your father in heaven does not communicate that way the bible it says jesus stands at the door and knocks but never once does it ever say you're rebuked because you won't open the door never once does it say you're condemned because you won't open the door it doesn't say that it says he stands at the door and knocks for as long as it takes he's standing at the door and he's knocking He does not barge in. All things in the earth are his. He has a right to come in anywhere he wants, but he does not. He never oversteps his bounds. So listen, he has a right to come into your life anytime he chooses, but he will not do it. If that's the King of kings and Lord of lords, if that is his way, and if the ways of men are prideful indeed, then an attribute of pride is to forcefully execute all of your rights. Do you hear that? To forcefully execute all of your rights is a way of the world, a way of pride, a way of men, not a way of righteousness. Somebody said one time, they said, they said, well, Mike, you ought to go ahead and say something because you have a right to free speech. I said, yeah, but man didn't give that to me. My father did. And in fact, he put me in a country to exercise those rights. 
A lot of people in America, and indeed in Europe, and any other place where Christianity is largely accepted. These are my thoughts. I think we've made a mistake. When you go back to slavery, those people did not know about Jesus Christ until the Bible was introduced to them while they were in slavery. They didn't know who God was until they entered into slavery. I don't know if a lot of you know this, but if you start searching genes, you know something about the African race. And indeed, they had to go back into slavery another 400 years. The Hebrews went to slavery 400 years, but they were broken during that time. God did it again. But listen, not the Africans, but the ones who came over here who were enslaved. A way was broken off of them and the gospel was given to them while they were in slavery. So they were broken of one belief in voodoo and all this other stuff, which, by the way, is still steeped in southern states in the U.S. But one way was broken off of them and a new way was presented. You cannot present a new way of faith unless your old way is broken down. God knows the process and he shows us this process in here. Often what we see is a, this massive evil act is beyond our comprehension to understand what God is really doing. Because what he does, he does over the course of generations. And so what he did was he raised a new people with faith. I believe that God had us born in a country where we could actually accomplish his will that he put in us. For example, if God put in you to go spread his gospel, and if he put in you to advocate for certain causes, and if he put in you to develop things and to reach people and demonstrate and help raise people and children in the right way which they should go, he's got to put you in a place where it's, it's, it's free for the gospel to be exercised. That's exactly what he did. I looked at the pilgrims who first came over here. They didn't believe in Christianity quite like you did. In fact, none of those individuals who first came over here believed in Christianity quite like we do. you got to remember they came from a monarchy and they believed in, in Christ in a very different way. And Catholicism was the rule of the day. But when they came over here to the United States, a lot of that was broken. It was broken down. And so they got away from a government being uh, faith-based or, or, or government ruling your faith. That was the course of true Babylon. See, in Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, he told everybody what they would believe in. He told everybody how to worship. He told everybody. And whatever he said for them to worship, it became lawful, just like our laws. The Lord said, no, I'm going to put, I'm going to have them raised in a place where they can freely exercise their faith so nothing will hinder them for the sake of raising generations in the USA and in places like Germany now. So we get the benefit of raising children without stigma, without this overhanging persecution that the old church used to be under. Nobody persecutes you because you believe in Christ. They just simply don't. It is freely exercised in the place where you are. So see, this is so we can work. The Lord put us in a place where we could be part of the harvest. I hope you understand that. He put us in a place where we could freely walk right into the harvest and begin to work. That's what he did. He put us in a place where we could exercise these things in the gospel of Jesus Christ without a large hindrance. Most of our problems have been the kingdoms of men and evil people doing things in the kingdoms of men. We're also learning how to do things. But we can freely exercise our walk into the harvest, our labors that we do for the Lord. So much so, there's really no restrictions on that because people make up wild things, don't they? People testify, but it's truly a test a lie. N nobody's throwing them into jail. So God has given us great liberty in this time, but, but you have to ask yourself, why would we do that? Because his prophecies will come to pass. In this time of the harvest, the corruption comes. In this time of the harvest, the darkness comes. In this time of the harvest, many fall away from the faith. And they start believing in other things. The challenges come. But we've been given an opportunity to work freely in the harvest. See, those who came before us, they could not work freely in the harvest. Many things are by force, and it was uh, it was very difficult to endure what they endured. You know, I had a thought, and I was thinking about combat. I said, my goodness, those in the Civil War, they didn't even have anesthesia. In other words, they would put you in a bed and start chopping limbs off with a hacksaw, and you would hear crying and screaming and everything else, and not everybody made it through an amputation. They just didn't. They would give them a bullet to bite down on. The bullet metal was soft, and they would give them a bullet to bite down on to numb the pain and lots of alcohol. But they did not numb the sight because they had nothing to numb the sight. Then you have to fight septicemia and all these things after the fact. So many of those who were amputated in these wars, they died. And I'm telling you this because they had knowledge that they could get shot and it could mean the end of their life. And they could have, you know, 10, 15 days enduring the, the greatest pains you ever had. But they still fought. If somebody told you, hey, if you go fight, you could potentially suffer for two months and great agonizing pain and no one would be able to help you, would you still go fight? A lot of people today will say, no, I will not. No, no, no morphine, no, no uh, antiseptic, no, none of that. And I have to suffer. I'd be like having a, a, a toothache. 
If somebody told you, hey, if you go and enter into this branch of service, they're going to induce a toothache on you that you have to endure for a year. How many of you would go in there and do that? I would not. Nobody likes a toothache. But these guys knew what they were facing. And I'm telling you, they were built different than us. They had to be kind of hardened. They had to be kind of rough or they would not have fought knowing the price they would have paid. So they were different men, a type of different people. But look at us today. We don't deal with those harsh conditions, do we? We have a perfect opportunity here to enter into the harvest without restriction. But the question is, have we? You see, the fight that we just wrote down is to keep you out of the harvest, period. Remember, Satan is always resisting the word of God in your life. That's what he's here for. He's the opposite of righteousness. And he will resist every piece of light where he finds he does not comprehend the light, but he will resist it. Part of his resistance is to get you not to enter into the harvest. To enter into the harvest is to go with the gospel, to go with the good news. And whatever portion the Lord has given you knowledge of, to go in there with that, to really share with people, to sit down with people, to be there when people have these upsetting days, to be there and to lift them up and encourage them in faith, to do these things in faith, not by evidence, but by faith as part of the harvest. But Satan will tell you, don't go in there. Well, why not? Because you're wasting your time. Why is that? Because these people never change. Why is that? Because they don't, you know, they're, they're this type people and we're this type. He's doing everything he can do to keep you from taking the gospel to somebody else because in the harvest, no one's forcing anybody to work. If that were not the case, the Lord would have never said the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. He said the laborers are few because he does not force anybody to work because it's all of the heart or it's not at all. No one is forced. But Satan is trying to do his little dirty tactics in the earth. See, if Satan can even force you to do something in the church, you will end up resenting it. He's doing everything he can do in the battle he's waging against your life every single day to cause you to abandon love itself, to make you militant. It's working with a world that is not purposed to work with you. So be careful of that. Don't let this world extinguish the love God put in your heart. By the way, in the Bible, it says God is love. So now you know what that love was that was initially put into you. That was your father in you. All that high compassion you have, that willingness to look over everything a person ever did. When everybody screams out, call him guilty. And in within your heart, you don't want to. You may have agreed to it to satisfy the crowd, but in your hearts of hearts, you did not want to. By weight of evidence, they cause you to convict people of lots of things, anything they can find. But the Lord called all of us out of that, did he not? Come out of her, my people. Do not partake of her sins that you won't partake of her plagues. He called us out of those ways, not to be like the world, but to come out of the world and to make a difference in it, to intercede for it, to walk through it. You're a passers-by. This is not your home. This is temporary. He called you to do the great work. So don't look to somebody else and try to follow what they're doing. He put a unique work within you. Don't let the world talk you out of it. Don't let the world extinguish that flame of love you have within yourselves. The Lord knows the world has taken much from us already. Don't let them take another inch. Don't let them convince you of any other thing. And a lot of us are going to have a battle getting out of the ways of the world. Even the Father already knows this. So there's no one in this house that can condemn you so long as you continue to choose Christ. We know the fight. It rages on. You're counted to be a victor in this war. A casualty is someone that does not know there is a war or someone who has entered into the war without making up their mind what actual side they're going to be on. The casualties in this war by no means like conventional war because everybody is involved. It will affect everybody, but each person will dictate how they are affected. So what do we do? Listen, it's this easy. It's called commitment to Christ. Not commitment to me, not commitment to anything else but to Christ. To commit to Christ means you will voice to the Lord. I can't do it for you. You voice to him and you do it on a daily basis because you know we have these flesh minds, which are, by the way, fickle. You voice to him every day, Lord, I choose to follow you this day and ask him to show you where he is that you may follow. It's that simple and seek to follow him and open your eyes, see the battle and be free from it. You're victorious already. You've already won. You'll never stand in that victorious lot so long as you have your eyes shut. Once you see this battle, you won't be hit by any of the bullets again. Do you know that? This war is not like a conventional war. You're hit by those things you don't see. This war is largely a choice. And I tell you, the world is constantly saying the same thing. So I want you guys to investigate yourselves with that list I gave you. Start listening 
to everything. You tell me what you hear. Listen to the world and tell me what you hear. Prove me wrong. Tell me that the world is not fighting to have you believe a specific thing on all sides. No matter what side it is, they're killing somebody else to make you believe in a specific way. That's what makes it so wrong. Murder is involved. That'd be like me throwing another pastor under the bus so that you guys only listen to me. How grotesque would that be? That's grotesque and forbidden in the kingdom of God. That's not in the heart of any true saint, but that's the devil's way. Who, by the way, has infiltrated the body of Christ and has elements of himself amongst us in our feasts of charity. Never forget that. These are spirits, ladies and gentlemen, and spirits use people. Caution. Anybody who is in a weak moment can be utilized by one of these ancient spirits to sow discord amongst the saints. Remember that. That means in my moment of weakness, I could easily be used by darkness. So what do we do when we see our brother and our sister in a weakened state? We don't do like Satan does and stomp on them and attack them because Satan kicks you when you're down. No, we pick them up with all faith, with all courage and all love. We encourage them, never forcing them to comply with us, but encouraging them all the way. Satan uses force. Our Father only invites. The Father sends out an invitation, but he will never force. He always sets before us life and death. And it's to us to choose. He doesn't force, but he does encourage us to choose life. And he's covered us should we choose life. He is a just God. And he is a caring father. He is merciful and full of grace. That's why we can get away with being so lethargic in our resolve. In other words, we are procrastinators and we have gotten away with it. We have gotten away with plenty of things. You know why? Because our father is merciful. Because he loves us. He does not hate us. He loves us. He cares for us. We have a real father in heaven. A real one. Not some fictitious father. A real one. And he really does care. He's given us so much time. He didn't strike us down when we deserved it. But what did he do? Did he not take our hands and lift us up? Did he not deliver us when we didn't even know the process of that deliverance? Didn't we find ourselves out of a situation with no comprehension of how that happened? Oh, how many times I should have been wiped off the face of the earth. But because of his love, I'm still here. You're not here and alive again today to be tormented. That's not why you're here. This isn't to be another sad day of your life. That's not why you're here. No, it's to be totally different. Maybe it's not been explained to a lot of people. Often when it's not explained, people have miserable days. That misery ends when you discover the truth. And that truth is beautiful. But again, it's often not explained. It is assumed that people automatically know and they do not. Please don't let this world make your hearts and your love wax cold. Please don't do it.